Hi, good afternoon. Hello. It works, good. I am Mike. I work for Head Forwards, um, and my role is something between product management, scrum master, digital person. Um, I was asked to fill in for somebody who had to cancel um, about three weeks ago, um, and then I went on holiday. So I haven't uh, maybe prepared as well as, you, as some of the other talks might have done. Um, and so I did what any reasonable person would do um, with a short deadline, which is I stole lots of other people's work and cobbled it together into a presentation. Um, so I've, uh, and when I say cobbled this together, I was still editing it uh, just now after Darwin's talk. <laughs> um, so I've not done this talk before, and I don't know if it fits in 40 minutes or not, and we'll all find out together whether I'm on time and on budget. Okay, so the, com the conversation today is about outcomes um, and what we mean by outcomes and how we can work to deliver better outcomes. And to understand why that's important, we, we need to think a little bit about what happens if we're not thinking about outcomes. So if we just focus on building the thing, you know, bad stuff can happen. And there's, I think, at least one person in the audience I might offend in a moment because we work together on this. Um, but you might remember 10 or so years ago, um, or you might not, more to the point, um, when I was working at Nokia, we had a very good idea, which was to build an unlimited music download service. And it was a really good idea, because at the time, the iPod was the thing, and music was encumbered by DRM, and it was expensive, and it was a bit of a pain syncing it onto your devices. And we had this great idea that if we could build the right partnerships and product, we could allow you to just download that stuff unlimited. You wouldn't have to pay for it. It was all included in the device. It was a very good idea. Um, it took us nearly two years to build it. And in the intervening two years, the iPhone came out and DRM free music became a thing. And by the time we launched, it was a little bit, mm, it was a little bit disappointing. The, it worked. When we rolled it out, we moved it to, to other countries, but it didn't really take off. It was a disappointment. I think for everybody who, who worked on that, we were, we were very disappointed. And it's not just me and products that I've worked on where this has happened. Um, but the world moved on, the world changed around us, and we didn't adapt to, to the new reality, the new context that we were operating within. So that's one reason that, um, that your product might fail, is that if you, if you start off with a good idea, but the world moves whilst you're working on it, by the time you come to market, it could be a completely different world. And the vast majority of products, it turns out, failed. And you'll have seen this name on a number of slides. Um, I don't, hopefully by now I don't need to tell you, you should read Marty Kagan's work, you should listen to what he has to say, you should wa watch his talks on YouTube. He works with a lot of different product companies inside and outside of Silicon Valley, and if he says that the vast majority of product efforts fail, this man knows what he's talking about. Does anybody know what this is? A really expensive juicer. It is a very expensive juicer. So the Juicero was $400 after its uh, $200 discount. Uh, the packets of juice that it worked with were between $5 and $8 a pouch. And it was a very uh, complex and well-engineered system for squeezing pre-chopped vegetables and juice into a glass of fresh, freshly squeezed juice. Vegetables or money. Uh, <laughs> vegetables or money, yes. Um, it had a barcode read on it, so you could scan the QR codes, and it would only dispense juice that was in date. Um, and, oh dear, I've, this is the slide where I had your, uh, your quote. Um, and, uh, and journalists discovered that if you held the pouches in your hand and squeezed them really hard, you could actually dispense with the $400 juicer um, and you could just have very, very expensive juice as opposed to ridiculously expensive juice. So, so this thing tanked and it is sort of held up as a bit of a, um, a poster child for, for ridiculous product hubris and thinking that you have an idea without actually proving whether it actually solves a problem for anybody. Um, onto the quote which Darwin just put on the screen in his presentation, so I'm sorry, <laughs> but you'll have seen this one before. But it is worth reiterating, there is no point doing something really well if there was no point in doing it at all. So the question maybe is, if we can hold up these examples that are maybe a bit, bit more famous, are we any better? Are we working any better in our own products? Um, in, on the products that we build, on the products that we design, are we actually listening to what those products help achieve and the outcomes that they create? Or are we just focusing on building the thing? So if you want to think about what your product enables and what it achieves to the business, there's um, outcomes are something, a tool that you can use to, to try and focus your thinking and to, and to plan around. And outcomes, I think you'll, 
we've seen discussed more in product management circles more recently, but that's not the, the place where they were invented. Um, in the public sector, in, sorry, not in the public sector, in the non-profit sector, um, the idea of working to deliver outcomes and developing a theory of change is, is fairly well established. Um, and the idea being if you want to create an impact, there are lots of different outcomes that you could uh, potentially create that would lead to this impact. And sometimes these are nested. There are things that you'll need to do or create to, to enable those outcomes, the, the activities of creating them and the sort of raw materials you'll need. So for example, if you are targeting improving life chances for a group of children, um, you might have identified that improving literacy in that group of children could you know, substantially improve their, their life chances. And that is an outcome. Improving literacy rates is an outcome. It's a bit of a laggy indicator of whether they're going to have a, a better life after they finish the education system. But it turns out, as I said, you can nest these. So if, you if there is a causal link between the number of books that children read and the levels of literacy that they attain, that's something you can start to measure. So you can measure, are these children reading the books? Are their literacy scores improving? And you might have a number of different ways that you could achieve that outcome of improving the number of books that children read. It might be build a library, it might be start a book reading club. There's loads of ways that you might, I am hypothesized, could, could cause that. And depending on what they are, there's different activities you'll need to undertake and different inputs you might need, like books and money and a building and volunteers or, or whatever, whatever the system is. So this is a fairly well-established way of looking at how, um, how charity investment, charity is the wrong word, but how investment is made in creating social impact. In the product development world, and I'll get to the book in a moment, but there's an excellent book called Outcomes Over Outputs by Josh Seiden, and he defines an outcome as a change in behaviour that drives a result. And some variations of this you might see as a change in customer behaviour or a change in a human behaviour or a user behaviour, but I think it's reasonable to say that it's a change in behaviour of, it could be a person, it could be a system, it could be a company, but it's a change in some behaviour that drives a result. And critically, you want this behaviour, wherever possible, to be something that you can measure This is the book, by the book. It's very thin. It's from the Sense and Respond Press, uh, which Josh Seiden and Jeff Gothelth uh, put together. Nearly all of their books that I've read have been excellent. I thoroughly recommend them. They only take a few minutes to read. So here's an example of a potential outcome that we could be aiming to achieve that will create, a, we believe, will create a result. So if I run an, an, um, an online retailer, I might have an overall objective of trying to grow my revenue per customer. And I have a theory that if I can increase the average basket size, that is the number of items that are in that basket, that this will lead to an increase in my growth per customer. So this is the outcome. This is something I can measure, is the, um, the average number of items that are in the customer's basket. And if I want to understand how I'm going to influence this outcome, then I really need to know what's happening. What's happening at the moment? How are people using it? Um, can I measure the, uh, do I have metrics around how this basket is being filled up? How does that process work? What does the, the checkout conversion funnel look like? Um, I need to understand whose behavior drives the outcome. In the case of the uh, e-commerce checkout, it might be quite simple. It's almost certainly the, the user, the shopper. But in more complex scenarios, it could be any number of um, stakeholders or individuals or policies that might Im influence that outcome. But once I understand whose behaviour drives that outcome, I can start to think about whose behaviour I might want to influence in order to achieve that outcome. So you can measure customer behaviour or user behaviour, but you should also be talking to customers to understand why is that behaviour happening? Why do the things that we observe happen? What's, what's their context when they're using your tool? And why does it result in this? And tools that can help you identify um, potential, pardon me, potential behaviour changes, and I'm not going to talk at length about this, um, it could be an impact map, where unhelpfully he talks about impacts in roughly the same place that I might talk about outcomes, but the idea is the same. We look at what we're trying to achieve, we look at who is the behaviour we might want to influence, we look at the types of uh, changes we might make to influence that behaviour, and therefore the things we might need to build or change or do um, in order to create that outcome, that impact. Um, as Matt shared yesterday, another way of, of having that same conversation and identifying those different options is with target mapping. 
Um, and as Darwin showed exactly the same screenshot about an hour ago, uh, Teresa Torres um, has the opportunity solution tree, which is another way of thinking about, for this particular desired outcome, what are the different opportunities that present themselves that might, we might be able to create a solution around and which we might be able to test. So I'm not going to talk at length about those tools because they're a presentation each in themselves. But when we're looking at what the different solutions are that we might put in place, what we might do, what we might build, try not to constrain that conversation by asking what we should do. Ask what we might do. And now that sounds really, that's like a tenuous, small change here, but if we open that conversation up to think about all the things that we could possibly do, all the ridiculous ideas might come to the fore, and some of them will be gold. So don't just try and think about what we should do, because that leads to sort of thinking about solutions and what we would build. Think about what behaviour we might create, how might we influence it. And also think about the trade-offs and the ethics around the, the impacts that you create. Um, so Facebook have, obviously have lots of goals around dr driving revenue and increasing customer engagement and, and getting people talking to one another. They probably didn't intend to subvert democracy, and it might just have been an inadvertent byproduct. I think they sort of demonstrated that they don't particularly care. But when they started out, I'm sure it wasn't their intention. And Netflix probably didn't intend to racially profile their customer base when they started personalising the different pack shots that they used to promote movies. But it turns out it happened. So it's important to think about the trade-offs of the kinds of um, outcomes that you create. And if I optimise one area of my product, what might that mean for the other areas? What, what could be the bad outcomes that could happen as well? And so when you're thinking about the metrics that you might want to measure or the behaviours you might want to change, you should also think about the, the guardrails that you might put up around the existing behaviour, the things that you want to maintain, the things that you don't want to influence. Um, so hopefully the next slide is the right one. Um, so whilst we're thinking about what can we do to increase the average basket size for my customer when they check out, let's also make sure that we don't uh, mess up the conversion rate on that, on that um, checkout process. We need to put boundaries around what we do and make sure that the, the outcomes we create are actually not going to make problems elsewhere. I think I'm talking a bit too fast. <laughs> I'm going to slow down a bit. <laughs> So there's lots of different options that might present themselves. If you put together the, the opportunity solution tree, if you put together an impact map, you could come up with a huge number of different solutions that you might build, behavior changes that you might want to create. So how do we choose? As much as possible, we want to rely on the customer data that we've got, and that could be qualitative data, where we've had conversations with customers, where we're talking to them about the challenges they face. And it could be quantitative data, where we're measuring how people engage with our systems, engage with our products. It's got to be a combination of these two things. Very often, um, it's easy to focus on the quantitative and to, to measure what's happening and to make assumptions about why that's happening. But those conversations with the users, with the customers, will really tell you actually what's causing the behavior that you observe. I love this quote. And <laughs> if you have data, then you should use that data. If you don't have data, then you're relying on opinions. And if you're relying on opinions, um, I have the oft-used expression, the hippo, the highest paid person's opinion often wins. And reality doesn't really care about your opinion. So it's important, wherever you can, to either to gather data, to create data, or to experiment and get the data that you need to understand which is the right direction to go in. Because... Picking between those different options, those different solutions that you might create, isn't really an exercise in trying to decide up front which one is going to work. It's about learning which one does work and then doubling down on it. So we want to create an environment where we are emphasising learning about which thing is the best, rather than creating an environment where we can argue about which one we think is best. And the quickest way to learn is to, to run experiments, to find out the quickest thing that you can do that will give you some real data and when you're not relying on opinions. Um, and, a, and a, just a little segue here. Maybe don't say experiment. I work for a company, or I'm working with a company at the moment who make health insurance products and they don't want me to experiment on their customers, that's for sure. So I'll talk about testing risks. I won't talk about assumptions because I'm not going to tell my stakeholders that everything that they've asked us to do is based on an assumption because 
Well, <laughs> people don't like to hear this. So I'll talk about testing risks. Um, and I just won't use that at all. Don't use that. Um, that acronym means different things to different people in different contexts. And one person uses, uses it, it might mean something totally different to someone else. So just, I mean, it's a good idea, but, but, but just don't say that. OK, so if we're going to develop a test around um, a change that we might want to make, then it, this, I mean, this isn't my idea. I should, probably should have quoted this at the bottom. I think this might be from um, Alex Osterwalder and David J. Bland's book on, on testing business ideas. Um, but they put together a, it's a, a sort of a, a card, a template. We believe that if we do this, this might be our solution, then this result will occur. And we know that we are right when this happens. So before we start doing our work, let's think about what is the outcome we are hoping to create and how will we know if we're actually creating it. Excuse me a sec. But also, when we're testing, especially if we're going to be testing for real with real people, real customers, real systems, let's design our tests at a scale where, if we're wrong, that we don't create a catastrophe. It's important to, to segment the user group that you test with or to run a study that's aside from your main product or to find a way that can tell you the answer to the, the questions you're trying to solve without betting the farm on, well, we're just going to totally change the checkout flow because, of course, it's going to work. So to run your tests at a scale where you can get enough information that, you're gonna, that will that give you the confidence whether you're on the right direction or not, but where if, it's horribly, if it goes horribly wrong, that you can turn that thing off or that it only affects a fraction of a percent of users. And the areas that we might want to test could be, and Darwin had three, I've got four. <laughs> um, is this product desirable? Do people want this? Do they, when they see what you're offering, do, does it make them want to engage? Do they, do they want to buy the thing? Um, can they use it? Does it actually help them? Um, do they understand it? Does it work in a way that, that works for them? Um, can you build it? Do you have the tools, the skills, um, is it something that your, your team can actually create? And, and can you actually build a business around this? Can you make the cost structures work so that whatever it is that you need to build and sell at the price that these people will buy will actually create a viable business for you? And is it legal? You've got to, you can test. Well, maybe it's a little bit easier to test this. But you can structure your tests in, in any number of these areas. And as, um, as we saw earlier, if you can identify the areas of your plan which are the highest risk, if you might be wrong, those are the places to start. And there's an excellent book um, from uh, David, David J. Bland and Alex Osterwalder, which, which covers in great detail lots of different options for the sorts of tests you might want to run in different circumstances, um, and ways and playbooks for running those tests. Um, so I thoroughly recommend this. Um, this, isn't the, this isn't the only book I'm plugging. <laughs> I should have put affiliate links in. So the question that I think is reasonable to ask is, is, well, that's all very well. Yes, of course, that makes sense. But, but how can I use that in the organization where I'm working? Because we, well, we don't work that way. Um, and what can I do to, to work better and to, to, to start using outcomes in the approach that we take to our work? So how can I be more deliberate about the work that I do so that it relates to the outcomes we want to create? But, and how can I help my organization to work this way? Um, now, I just totally stole this slide from John Cutler. Um, but at least I gave him credit. <laughs> um, I was watching a, a YouTube talk of his um, a few weeks back, um, trying to get ideas for what I was going to talk about, actually. And I saw this, and I thought, I could probably make a whole talk out of this. So this, this is what I've tried to do. Um, and this really is, represents the, the different levels that your team might be working at, or the different brief that your team might be given. And an awful lot of us find ourselves working here, build this thing. Um, and some, some of the teams I've worked with on some occasions build something that does this, build something that lets customers do that. Less frequently, I found myself working with teams who've been asked to solve a particular problem or to improve the experience for a group of people. It's very rare, I found, that, that we're working down here. And in fact, in the same, I think, talk uh, that John did, um, he said, it's a, it's a fantasy that we work this way. We all talk about outcomes, but what, 10% of the time we're actually working this way? We, we, like, we love to think that we can do this, um, but we're not doing it. 
And that kind of made me feel a bit better, I've got to be honest, because it's fairly rare. Um, so the question is, how can we get ourselves from working like this and briefing our teams like this to be further down here? And I'm, I'm not going to talk a, a great deal about these two because, to be perfectly honest, I don't have any uh, directly relevant experience that I can talk from, and it would be, it would be a lie if I said I did. So if you're working in an environment where you, your team, have been briefed with building this thing, what can you do? Because you haven't really got the latitude to say, well, we're going to go and experiment on users and we're going to try this thing and try that thing. Um, it's always good to, to see if you can push the boundaries. But what can, what can you do? So the first thing, which I don't know, we talk about this and we've been talking about this for 20 years, is to write user stories. But actually write actual user stories that say who it's for and say why they need it and maybe add in the whereas at the bottom that says, and at the moment, they have to do this. So as a user, I want to so that. But at the moment, I have to. Actually get that information in there, um, partly because it gives a little bit of context around the work that the team are doing. And, it, and it, just a little bit, it brings those users closer to the people who are writing the software. And you can't really be thinking about how you're going to make people's lives better if you're not even thinking about those people at all. So at the very least, be writing user stories. And in the process of writing those user stories, as much as you can, get the team, the development team, the design team, whoever it is who's doing the work, to work with actual users to understand what the test cases are. So don't guess or take the product owner's word for it. Or if you are the product owner, don't, just pretend, don't pretend you know and tell the team what the test cases are. Find the people who use this system or will, will be using this system and get them to help you write the test cases. Try to find out whether you should be building the thing. So we're not saying, well, you're going to put your hands up and go, well, I'm not going to build that. What are you talking about? But try to understand why, why you should be building this thing. Be the person who asks stupid questions. When, when the organization says, you're right, Mike, we need you to, and your team to build this thing, ask the stupid questions. Right at the beginning, it's the best opportunity you've got. Um, Tim Harford has a, a good talk where he recounts uh, an economic study from years ago, which if I could remember who did it, I would, I would credit them. But they, um, they tested whether groups of people in a room would give a different answer to the rest of the room. If everyone else in the room was giving the wrong answer, would the test subject, who had no idea, um, actually pipe up and say, no, no, I think the answer's B. I don't know why you guys are all saying A. And it turns out... Almost no one will do that, but it only takes one dissenting voice. It only takes one person in that group to also ask a stupid question or to say, I'm not sure about that, before it opens up the conversation for other people to start asking questions. So be the person who asks stupid questions. There's no such thing as a stupid question. But ask nicely. Don't ask questions in a way that implies that the person that you're talking to has no idea what they're talking about, because they probably do know what they're talking about, but you still want to understand why, they, why they're asking you to do this thing. Ask them about the problem that it's intended to solve. Ask them for the data about how this, this problem is solved currently. Try and baseline how that works and how well it doesn't work. Um, ask what the, the change that you're being asked with to, to develop. Ask how it might influence the outcome. Measure the outcome that it creates. And when you're learning about how this solution is meant to, to solve a particular problem, identify those risks. We talked about it a little bit earlier. But if you can see, maybe just in, a, in the straight implementation plan that you've been given, there's, there's areas here where we've kinda, we think it's going to work, but we actually don't know. Maybe we've never seen the data, but we've made some assumptions about what shape it is. Get in there and, and prioritize those things. Test them first. I think I might have missed a bit. I have. So I was going to tell you about a system that I was working on uh, with a team last year. We'd, um, we'd been asked to build a, a tool that would take uh, price lists and build a, a sort of auditing tool and it would integrate with a third party invoice clearing house and it would reject invoices where the suppliers had charged us too much for the thing if it was above the list price. And we had a really complicated system it needed to integrate with. And we had a third party who we were going to upload these great big CSV files into, and it would spit out any invoices that were wrong. And it was quite a considerable chunk of work, and there were tens of thousands of products in the price list. Um, and we'd never seen the data until after we'd signed the contract to get hold of the data. 
And after much <laughs> debate and arguing, one of the first things we did was with the work, working with the audit team, um, we identified a couple of particular products where they quite often see problems in the way those things are built. And we manually crafted the rows that go into that CSV file. So instead of having 20,000 products in it, it had three. And we uploaded them into the clearinghouse so that when the invoices came in, if any of them had that product, then those ones would at least get checked. Um, and we kind of presented that as verifying that actually this system will do the thing you want it to do. We're not going to build all of it, but we're going to build this really thin slice through it that sort of proves if we take this bit at the beginning and we put it into the bit at the end, does it actually create what we want? Um, and it did, you know, it worked. We, the data worked, it went through, and you, we rejected the invoices. And the suppliers whose um, invoices we rejected went absolutely apeshit. And so we learned something really important there, which is that if you can really upset those people by rejecting two or three of their invoices, what's going to happen when you reject tens of thousands of them? And we also learned that the way that we were going to measure our success on that project, it wasn't really going to work, because we'd envisaged that... For every invoice that was rejected, we would kind of claim the difference between what it was and what it should have been as, well, that's money we've saved the company. Um, but it turns out that when you go to that supplier and say, we're rejecting that invoice because you've priced that product wrong, they don't do that again. And so <laughs> the next invoice that comes through has got it priced correctly. Um, so we also learned that we had to account for the work we were doing differently. And all of those are things that, had we waited until we'd spent six, eight months building this system and piped 20,000 products through it, it would have just been really wrong rather than a bit wrong. So getting, the, getting those learnings in early um, and testing some of the assumptions, it didn't really tell us much about our solution, but it certainly told us a lot more about the business context that went around the tool that we were building. OK, um, so the next up, up, down, up, John's ladder. Um, build something that does a process. Um, so you, you could build the thing, you could build it, it could do the process, and you could carry on with your day. But it's, it can be quite important to understand who needs that process, to talk to those people, talk with those people, understand why they need that process. Um, how, does, how does it work for them now? Why is it important? Understand if they actually need it. Um, verify if the process that uh, your understanding of it is correct. Um, build the simplest version of it you can. Uh, iterate on that. I'm not sure is Dave in the room. Dave, Dave might be able to correct me if I misspeak. I think uh, Dave was working on a tool which had some reporting requirements around it. And there was quite a substantial amount of reporting requirements that went around that. Um, the first part that they did was build the data feed that allowed you to create one report in Power BI. Um, and the team who had been asking for all these port reporting requirements got their one report, and you never heard from them again. So the rest of it didn't need building at all, it turns out. And that's an excellent saving if you, can, if you can find that out. He didn't argue with me, so I guess it was close enough. <laughs> okay, build something that lets users do a task. Well, now we're talking, aren't we? And this is what we want. We've been... We've been set a bit of a more open brief. We've got some creativity we can put here. Excellent. We can create different options for how we might allow the user to solve that task. We can mock them up. We could create prototypes. We could maybe even ship bare bones functionality. We could do usability testing. We can find out which versions of our ideas people um, can use and which ones they can't use. But stop. Don't do that. Go talk to those people first. Find out a bit more about that task. Find out why they need to do it. Listen to them. Don't talk to them. Listen to your customers. Don't talk to your customers. Find out more about the processes that they're trying to work within, the, the tasks that they've got, and why they need the thing that you've been briefed with building for them. What is it that they're trying to achieve? Why do they need to do it? Can you structure that as a story map to show the different steps that you might go through in that process um, of, of getting that task done? Um, if you can create a slice across the story map, the absolute thinnest one you can. So in, in the um, auditing example, we basically built the beginning and the end and made up the bit in the middle manually. But that at least allowed us to get from one end of the map to the other. So build that thing and see if it actually creates the outcome that you're aiming to achieve. And if it does, iterate on it, make it better. And if it doesn't, evaluate why. Um, and I inserted a short segue into story maps because I wasn't sure <laughs> whether anyone had talked about them or not. I think maybe someone did yesterday. Um, but just quickly, in case you, if you don't know about story maps, this is from a different presentation I did a while ago. Um, 
collecting the different tasks that you might need to do in order to, uh, to, to complete a, an overarching task. Um, and this is like the, the sort of uh, standard way of teaching this is getting here to listen to my presentation. What did everyone have to do? And there's loads of stuff that you had to do in the morning and that I had to do some work beforehand. I had to have lunch. I had to go find the auditorium. I had to pack my bag. I had to drive to work. I had to watch the presentation. Maybe that was Barney's presentation when I put this together. Um, I was going to ask questions. And I put all those things into my story maps. This is the spine that, that Darwin mentioned earlier. These are the broad categories of work that I need to get done in order to, uh, to complete my task. And I've organized these as much as I can in priority order. These are the things that I absolutely desperately need to get done. These things, well, I probably do need to do them, or I might be different options for how I can get my task done. So the thin slice, the, the, the bit you want to try and get to in your first iteration, look at that, is the absolute bare minimum. Like, what can we not remove um, from this and, and allow, allow the user to complete their task? So I don't really need to clean my teeth before I come to the presentation. I don't really have to <laughs> eat breakfast or get my daughters to get dressed and ready for school or walk the dog. I don't have to do those things. But I definitely need to wake up, go to the loo, get dressed. Um, I probably need to pack my bag and get to work. And I definitely need to go to the room where the talk is happening. So these are the, these are the critical things. So create that thin slice and build that first. And then if it works and if it starts to create the outcome you're after, then you can look at making that process better. Um, and <laughs> so I'm just may as well just taking your slides. Um, yeah, buy this book too. Jeff Patton, um, his book is excellent. His YouTube talks on the topic are long, um, but also excellent. Okay, so you've spoken to your users. You've understood the task they're trying to complete. You've created the map. Now you can get into creating your mock-ups. You can create your prototypes. You can test those things with the users. If that's where the risk is around usability or desirability, you can test these ideas. You could put something into production to see if it actually works, the, the simplest thing that you could possibly do. And you see which ones do they use, um, sorry, which ones can they use, and do they use it? And as much as possible, try to, to build and ship um, iteratively, by which I mean to create something simple that you can build upon rather than create chunks sequentially of a whole thing that's not done until it's done. And measure whether you're reaching that outcome as, as early as you can. and Get that feedback, whether that is the measurements that you're taking of how your system is used or the conversations that you have with the customers. But get that feedback on how well it's allowing the user to complete their task, how well it meets that user's needs. Um, and if the feedback is bad, Maybe iterate, or perhaps bin it. Um, and if the feedback's good, well, stop, do something else. There's probably far more important things for you to be doing than finessing something which already solves your user's problem. OK, so the next layer down is to solve this customer's problem. And again, listen to your customers. Understand if they even have this problem. Just because you've been asked to solve the problem for a customer doesn't necessarily mean that they have that problem. So have those conversations with them. Ask them about the last time they encountered that problem. Don't ask them to think about that problem and whether they want it solving. Ask them about the last time that they, they had that problem. Understand the context in which it happened and the problems it caused for them. And ask them how they solve it now. What have they tried? Because if the answer to what have you tried to solve this is, oh, well, then it's probably not a problem. Because if they're not desperately trying to solve it, it's probably not that important. OK, um, moving down John's list. Um, improve the experience for a group of people. Again, talk with your customers. Understand what works for them about your product. Understand what doesn't work for them. You might have been given a brief. Uh, the team that I was working with Oh, it seems like 100 years ago, but I think it might have been in 2019. <laughs> um, we were asked to improve the experience of the software we were working on for partially sighted users. We got the feedback that um, users with screen readers they can't use the software. It doesn't, doesn't work for them, which was a bit of a surprise to us because we thought we'd done a reasonably good job of building something that was accessible and, and that worked. Um, so we, we spoke to them, um, and actually it did work, mostly. But there was... a there was a screen which 
I mean, it was accessible. It, you ran it through Microsoft's tool. All the ticks went green. All the links you needed to could be got to. But if you needed to get to the 40th or 100th search result, you had to press the button 500 times to get down there. And we learned that just because something passed the test and just because something met the standards doesn't mean that it actually worked for the users. So we understood more about that problem. Um, we also spoke to a gentleman who was losing his sight, who had also given feedback that he couldn't use our software. Um, and he, had, uh, he used a different part of it, and he had more challenges with it. And we arranged for a consultancy to come with us to, to sit in that call center and to work with that person to understand more about how they use the software and what we would need to change um, to make it work for them. Um, and one of the things we found was that actually he had no idea how to use the software that he had been given to, to help him manage his disability. And he didn't need to use our tool all that much, but he just didn't know how to. And we took the, the half hour that we'd allotted to sit with him and the, and the consultant that we'd brought um, and trained him in how to use the screen reader software, which is far more impactful for him than us changing a couple of things about the application. Um, and it helped him with no, no end with, with his work and with his satisfaction. So, so understand what it is that, that uh, causes problems for your customers with, with when they experience your tools. And, and really talk to them and, and go and see them where they are and, and learn from how they use what you've made for them um, before you then start to hypothesize about what you might need to make better for them. OK, the next uh, level down up is to optimize this metric. Um, and now this is quite a, can be quite a broad question. If we're going back to that, um, that earlier example, increase our revenue by um, increasing the, the basket size, wow, there might be thousands of ways you could do that. I can, I can only think of a couple. But there's loads of different ways that you can do that. But understand which things about your experience actually drive that metric. And understand whether that metric is really laggy. If you're looking at, say, annual revenue, if, you're, if your goal is to increase... And their annual revenue per customer or something like that. Well, you're going to have to wait a year before you find out whether you solve that problem. So which changes in behavior can you, can you find and prove there's some causation between what you're doing and the influence it will have on that longer-term metric? And try and find that leading indicator. Um, so in the case of the, the earlier example, we're talking about increasing the, the size of the basket. Now, you can test that relatively quickly. You only need... A, a relatively small number of transactions to understand whether you've increased the number of products that people put in their shopping basket. OK, and whatever you do, make sure you're communicating what you've learned, what you've done, um, what surprised you, and what you're going to do next to, to, to everyone, really. <laughs> it, you can't repeat yourself too many times. Um, so whether you're writing internal blog posts, whether you're sending emails, whether you're doing presentations, you should be doing all of these things. You want to particularly want to be telling the people in your organization what you've learned, because that then creates that environment where it's understood that if you, under, if you take these activities, if you do this testing, you'll learn things that you didn't know, and you'll drive the product in a better direction. Uh, one of the more uncomfortable ones of those uh, sessions of one of those was when uh, some of my colleagues and I went to India to test, again, the Nokia Music Store, um, speaking to real customers in Nokia stores in malls in India, we discovered that there was no way in hell that they were paying for music <laughs> and no way in hell that they were going to plug their phone into anything in an internet cafe. Uh, that, was, that was an important learning when you're, when you're going to launch a service to a, to a country of that size. And we really were right back to the drawing board with how we were going to do our go-to-market and what our proposition was. When the actual product that we built didn't change a vast amount, but the value proposition that we created around it and how we talked about it, that all changed as a result of understanding that Buying digital music was absolutely not a thing in India. OK, so what can I do to support my organization? If I'm working in a role maybe where I'm not in a product team and I'm not working directly with the developers and designers, but maybe I'm setting the strategy or doing, doing other roles that, um, that, that involve working with product, what can I do to support the organization to work this way? I think one of the first things is to recognize that if you structure everything that you do and the way you plan around delivering something specific, even if it works, you're really constraining the, the solution space and you're potentially missing out on a huge number of opportunities where you might be able to deliver a better outcome for your customers. So 
if you can, if, you, if you're empowered to do this, if you have the influence in your organisation, really st stop working this way. T tasking teams with building specific things is really allowing them to abdicate responsibility for it if it doesn't <coughs> deliver the outcome that you work. If you, if you tell a team, build this, and then it doesn't deliver what you expected it to, well, it's not their fault because you told them to do it. It's your fault. And also think about how you fund initiatives. Often, uh, the, the funding that's made available for a piece of work will be, will be uh, sought up front. The, the business case might be put together. The work might span months or even quarters or years. Um, and the funding is, is then sort of tied to delivery of the thing. Ship the thing, deliver the thing, get it done by this time, get it done within this budget. And those all sound like perfectly sensible um, perfectly sensible things that you'd want to do is to get it done on time and within budget. But they lead you back to that same place where you're driving the, the work to, to, to be done by a time and be done in a budget and not to focus on whether it actually meets the, uh, the outcomes and solves the problems that you envisaged. So if you can structure the way that you fund initiatives around learning, around delivering incremental improvements, about learning if what you're doing is actually making life better, if it's delivering the business results that you want, and to divide that up into smaller chunks, you can then make interim decisions. And if you find that this idea that you had, that you've maybe invested in a team for a quarter, they've, and they've gone away and they've done their research and they found, like we found, that no one wants to buy the thing, well, excellent, you found that out after a quarter and you had maybe a research team working on it, and you can kill that project and you save yourself millions of pounds. Or you might get partway through what you thought was going to be an 18-month initiative and you've been evaluating, say, every quarter again. Are we creating the outcome that we thought this would? Are we iteratively improving this product? And maybe you find after nine months, well, we, we made it better in the first quarter and we made it better in the, sixth, sorry, in the, in the second quarter, but in the third quarter, we, we didn't really push the needle at all. Perhaps, perhaps it's time now to, to stop spending money on this thing and go spend the money where it might actually have an effect. So look at how you fund projects. Um, and take a more uh, a portfolio view of, of that and understand that some of those things were going to work the way you thought they were and some of the things are not going to work the way you thought they were. Okay. Um, another quote from Marty Kagan, which I forgot to actually put in the slides, is that the, second inconven the first inconvenient truth was that everything fails. The second inconvenient truth is even when you find something that's going to work, you have to iterate on it before you find the best solution. So you should expect that your teams will have to iterate. And the plans that you put together and the timelines that you expect for that work to happen should accommodate the fact that this will have to happen if you actually want to create the outcome that you're looking for and that you're very unlikely to build it right the first time. So don't cram your roadmaps with, well, we're going to build this thing, and then straight afterwards we're going to build that thing, because the first thing will probably take two or three, four attempts to, to actually create the result you want. And look at how you measure the performance of the teams and how you incentivize them. Um, there's a slight segue into OKRs here. I won't labor it, because I think several people have talked about OKRs um, today and yesterday. But if you can structure your incentives around the way that you want your team to work, that key result, the KR in OKR, can, can be that outcome. Uh, the objective is that impact that you're trying to create. So set the team, the OKRs of the objective is we want you to grow revenue per customer. And the key result we're going to measure you on is whether you were able to increase their basket size. Oh, I think I'm, I'm almost out of time. So I told you I had no idea how long this was going to take. And absolutely, look at whether the incentives that you put in place around your team's performance and how they're measured are aligned to the way you want them to work. Because if you want them to do research and to learn and to find their way through this maze and deliver really good outcomes, but you incentivize them and their bonus structures are built around whether they build things on time and on budget and whether they um, get things done on, within the deadline, whether their velocity is it's consistent, then you're not going to get what you want because people will work to the ways that their incentives, the ways that they are incentivized. Okay, I'm almost done, so you get to go outside soon. Um, and if something's important, if something's super critical to your business, you might very well want to look at setting the same objective to multiple teams. If it's that important. Um, you might have a number of teams all working to solve the same problem 
in different ways. And some of those teams, you might say, well, we'd like you to look at how you can improve XYZ um, metric because it's going to help with the revenue and you know, solve whatever the company problem is. And at the other end of the scale, ooh, oh, I think I spoilt it now. <laughs> at the other end of the scale, you might want some teams to be working on solving the same problem, but a total moonshot and the chances of succeeding may be a lot lower, but the payoff could be a lot higher. And you can take a portfolio view on those types of um, improvements and understand whether like, you might, it's, like, it's a really inefficient way of working. Okay? You might have five teams working on solving one problem, but if that problem is really important, it's important that you find the solution and that you find the one that works best. Um, it's sort of borrowing a little bit from uh, the Toyota production system. They had this idea of set-based concurrent engineering where you might you create lots of different solutions to the same problems and gradually eliminate the ones that don't work until you find the one that works best. And if your business has problems that, um, that really need solving, this, this is a very inefficient but very effective way of finding a solution that solves the problem. Um, and expect that things won't work. And that's what we're trying to find out. If we've got 100 ideas, we need to find the 95 that are rubbish. And we're going to test them and some of them are going to fail. We need to expect that. Um, there was a paper that was, um, that was nearly 11, 12 years ago now. Some researchers at Microsoft uncovered that in the experimentation that they were doing on MSN and on the associated websites, about a third of the initiatives that they undertook um, had a positive impact on the metric that they were trying to drive. About one third of them had absolutely no impact whatsoever, and about a third of them made things worse. Um, Amazon reckoned that around half the stuff they try doesn't work. Um, you're probably not better at this than Amazon are. So if they expect half the stuff they try to not work, you should expect half the stuff they try to not work. But also, um, I don't have any data to prove this, but I read that Netflix um, expect about 90% of the things that they try not to work. And that's not because they're really bad at this. It's because they have a much higher appetite for risk and they're much happier to test things that won't work and they can constrain the blast radius of things that will fail and they can try stuff out and see whether something works. So you have to be willing to expect failure and, and to support teams um, and not to uh, chastise them when they do fail. Um, and lastly, going back to, to John's list, start from where you are and just try and move up a level. Wherever you are right now, there's no point trying to jump from build this thing to solve this 12-month business problem, just move up a level and just push things a little bit further than where you are now. Uh, that's me.